Hello, and thank you for uh, choosing this session. Uh, I'm Georgie Cohen, Director of Digital Strategy at OHO Interactive, a full service digital agency uh, tailored to higher education. Uh, this presentation is called Get Real, Authentically Reinforcing Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Through Your Digital Marketing. Uh, so when we're talking about this, what do we, what do we actually mean here? There's a, there's a few things. What we really mean is, this means communicating an accurate and believable sense of how your institution prioritizes diversity, equity, and inclusion. And accurate and believable are really important terms here. We're not trying to uh, convey a false impression or give a false or inflated sense of uh, what you're doing or what your priorities are. Why does this matter? Uh, it, it matters for a lot of reasons. It can help build affinity to, between people and your institution. It can increase engagement with your institution, really demonstrate your commitment to these issues, and can even corroborate third-party rankings uh, around um, you know, diversity or diverse environments on campus. But ultimately, it's important because it's the right thing to do. Um, to be able to really be truly uh, inclusive and, and having outreach and engagement with, with, all, uh, with all individuals. But why is this, this hard? Uh, this could be a very fraught and challenging topic. Uh, it doesn't come without some difficulty. There's a few reasons for that. Um, primarily, if your marketing team lacks diversity, that means that you have a pretty limited range of perspectives to inform your communications efforts and priorities. You're not gonna be able to effectively engage with a particular segment if you don't have any insight uh, into understanding where they're coming from, what their needs are, what their preferences are, uh, what they're looking for, what their concerns are. Um, you know, the, the perspectives that inform your marketing plan are going to um, you know, have a real key uh, role here. It's also hard because there's often a lack of structured accountability to communications goals around uh, DEI initiatives. Um, we can sort of say that we want to reflect more diversity. We could say these things and, and give really sort of inspirational messages about it. Um, but how do we really hold ourselves accountable to that? How do you really set goals and, and set targets and really um, operationalize how you are uh, meeting that objective and how you're fulfilling that goal? Also, authenticity is really hard to pin down. Um, you know, it's a word that gets bandied around a lot in marketing, but what authenticity actually means and how to do it um, can be elusive sometimes. It's also really hard to balance that sense of authenticity against aspiration because you don't want to reflect something that you're not, but you may also want to communicate something that your work that you uh, that you want to be. Um, oftentimes, these uh, you know an institution working to become more inclusive to uh, increase its diversity. It's a work in progress. Um, you have to start somewhere, um, and you want to give that sense of aspiration, but you also don't want to um, give a false portrait of where you actually are now. That can be challenging. We also have to do this without placing undue, asking for undue labor from persons who have suffered from our past failures. This isn't the job of um, you know, marginalized people who have people who have been systematically marginalized um, to then fix this um, on behalf of the people who um, have you know, disenfranchised them over the years. So how do we do it, right? There's a lot of factors here. There's a lot of opportunities. Um, but how do we actually make this happen? One of the first and most important things to consider really foundationally are your internal partnerships. Um, so diversity is not a monolith. So what does it mean at your institution? Every institution is gonna have different concerns, different histories, different backgrounds, different goals, um, different opportunities related to diversity. Um, and diversity does not just mean racial diversity. Uh, it plays into ethnicity, faith, gender, sexuality, age, socioeconomic factors, geography, neurodiversity, ability. There's a whole range of different considerations when we're talking about diversity. It's not just one thing. My computer is not working well. And there's a lot of different offices uh, on your campus that might have a role in that. Um, it could be your Office of Diversity and Inclusion or Equal Opportunity. You might have a Chief Diversity Officer, um, your Office of Disability Services, Human Resources, and any range of student groups um, are really groups that, to, that you should form partnerships with and reach out to, to really try to learn more. Um, you're likely going to be in a position of learning here um, to really understand how your efforts as a, a digital professional can help support what the institution is trying to do through these various functions. And you want to meet regularly. You don't 
just want to meet once, consider that, that you've learned everything and go about your merry way. You want to meet to keep learning, but also report back and say, we tried this, we're doing this, get feedback and input. Come with questions and be ready to learn. Um, identify some priority areas to focus on out of those conversations and turn those into action plans for improvement. Share the outcomes of your efforts back with those stakeholders. Again, as you're having those regular meetings, it's a great chance to report back on what you've done and what the outcomes have been. And get feedback and buy-in on changes to the editorial process. If you're going to um, be thinking about how you organize or, or uh, photos a different way or, or select news coverage a different way, uh, it's a great opportunity to get feedback on that. So the University of Michigan, um, their diversity, equity, and inclusion office uh, created a strategic plan um, that really reached out across the institution uh, to really create uh, in different uh, divisions uh, to really distill the university's DEI objectives into different functions. So there's a marketing and communications uh, strategic planning toolkit there where they're talking about their goals from a marketing perspective, evaluation and impact, and other uh, planning and implementation approaches. Uh, and that's really great to see um, that it isn't just sort of existing at this very high top level and we have to sort of guess how that relates to the marketing and communications function, but that that work is being done as part of this overall planning process. The University of Michigan's decision to involve every unit in addressing DEI is based on the understanding that effective culture change requires an ongoing commitment throughout the organization. That's part of their uh, kind of introduction to this. I think it's a really important point to consider. Uh, it's not just one office's job, it's everybody's job. Um, everybody has a, a role in owning getting this work done. They may not realize it, but they do. But understanding without power is like a car without gas. So any ideas that you have, any of these initiatives or thoughts, you need the executive authority backing them up to really uh, drive them forward. So it's, and leadership has to be a part of the conversation. Report, engaging regularly, sharing those outcomes, drawing connections between those broader institutional DEI concerns and your marketing efforts. Um, if you've been looking to sort of uh, find a wedge to prioritize accessibility more, uh, this could be uh, a, a one way to do that, for example. Review and testing. Uh, so it's really important before you sort of charge ahead and say we're going to change things to really be reflective and understand your current state. So one is defining your DEI goal. So again, as you have engaged with those institutional partners, you have a sense of where the institution is going and what's being done. Uh, then you can sort of confirm uh, what the opportunities and, and goals are from the marketing communications perspective in conjunction with those institutional partners. Then you really want to understand your audience and your key segments. As we're talking about um, the different uh, audiences and segments that you're communicating towards, make sure your understanding is current. Uh, is there additional surveys or focus groups or understanding that you need to do uh, to really um, you know, uh, gain a deeper understanding to help focus your review? Then there's defining the scope of your review. So uh, as you have a lot of different um, marketing efforts and communications and publications out there, um, you really have to prioritize your efforts. Um, and also tackling a representative set of content might be helpful. If you have program brochures for every program or program pages, you might look at a subset of those and extrapolate those findings to others. Then you really want to undertake an audit of those, of those uh, communications. So you really want to find the issues that you have there. Um, it could be a gap in communication, could be unintentional harm done via content. And, and as you sort of identify those opportunities, uh, really gauge the effort of how much work needs to be done uh, to, to rectify this. And then it's also about the edits. The, oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, ah, the keynote's going well. Uh, so some audit considerations here. One is visible expression of diversity across different editorial types. This is not going to be one of those sort of rainbow photos where we're kind of showing, look, we have people from every uh, racial background here at our institution. Uh, but it's also about the dynamics in which those individuals are presented. Uh, for instance, it might just be showcasing on a page about faculty or academics. Uh, the main photo is a faculty member of color who's leading an engaging class discussion. That photo, it's not many photographs, it's not a photograph of every person you have who meets certain criteria, but it's more about showing, hey, we, we, want, we want to sort of illustrate uh, that we value having people of color in a leadership role uh, and engaging people. Uh, it's also important to think about authenticity uh, against stock photography. Stock or staged imagery resonates really poorly in many ways, but if you're looking to sort of convey an authentic sense of where your community is at and how inclusive you are, stock photography is not going to help you.
It's also important to consider an appropriate use of language and terminology and using language in a way that avoids bias or stereotypes or hurtful cliches. For example, you don't want to refer to someone as wheelchair bound, call them a wheelchair user. There's also the findability of specific information targeted to relevant segments. So if you have scholarships for socioeconomically disadvantaged students, are those easy to find? Are you avoiding jargon um, that could put off first generation students in your admissions content? Um, are you making sure that if you're talking about how trans students are welcome at your institution, you're not only speaking to them in the health services context, for example. And again, as you do this review and this auditing and this testing, share your findings, make people aware uh, and report a company that with an action plan for how to address it. That's where the gauging the effort part comes in really handy. Share that with the Marcom team, to your DEI partners, to senior leadership. So they're aware of what the issues are, why these issues matter and how to address them going forward. Then the last bit here is establishing inclusive editorial processes. So figuring out how to really evolve the substance of content going forward. How do we change the process by which future content gets created to make sure it's aligning uh, to these uh, priorities that we, uh, that we are uh, turning our attention towards. So a lot of times the editorial process, it feels like firefighting. Someone emails and says, promote my event, promote my book, do this. And we're kind of trying to sort of um, just sort of wrangle those fires and, and put them out and sort of meet the need, right? It's kind of more of a reactive format. Um, so maybe, you know, a, a, di a different approach could be sort of a little, being a little more aware uh, and proactive of how to manage the fires, how to set expectations, um, how to establish criteria. It's kind of like the alarm system, right? You're able to sort of uh, detect uh, opportunities or issues before they become a big problem. But it's also about thinking about how to build those priorities into your editorial planning and content training. So you move even more away from a reactive standpoint and really equip people to understand and equip yourselves to understand how to make decisions that really have those priorities and considerations baked in. Uh, and then making sure you're reporting on the effectiveness of that approach. Uh, you can assign KPIs to, to gauge your success. Uh, you know, we, we're gonna set a goal for uh, stories that are, you know, are more representative, stories that are really uh, championing these initiatives and showcasing Facing, um, you know, different uh, aspects of our community. Did we achieve that? Let's set a target and measure and hold ourselves accountable to that. There's also the idea of a content review committee. So this is sometimes done um, with books to have sort of uh, read, reading done to uh, gauge it, uh, something called a sensitivity reader. So it's the idea of getting feedback on unpublished or draft content. It could be a new, a new view book, it could be a new web page, proofs from a recent photo shoot. Uh, having similar criteria to what guided your audit can be helpful uh, to sort of look through that through relevant lived experience and determine if content is effectively authentic and representative and doing that on a regular basis. This is where it really helps to think about the diversity that's built into your team to make sure that you have those lenses uh, informing uh, your future efforts. And there's content testing. So being able to undertake a variety of exercises, whether it's a highlighter test uh, where people might highlight uh, different uh, words or sentences on a, a, a page uh, with a green or red, if it increases or decreases their confidence in the information or their, their affinity, for example. Uh, it could be media sentiment. Uh, there's a tool called Alchemer where you can watch a video and sort of rate as the video goes, um, whether it makes you happy or sad, positive or negative. So you can understand um, the sentiment that people have, the feeling they have in viewing that. Card sorts, usability testing, user research, all of these can really deepen your insights to understand what's effective and what's not. So content guidelines. I really love what the University of Dayton has done. It's really kind of a set of best practice principles um, for um, diversity and inclusion in MarCom. Sharing multiple voices and perspectives, using inclusive language, authentically representing diversity, inclusive emojis and icons, which I thought was really interesting, accessibility guidelines, mo moderation of social media comments, educating yourself and asking questions. So this is not a detailed style guide, but it really kind of sets kind of a, a, a pillar for their team to understand all of, we should all be sort of aligning to these uh, core principles. I think those are important to define to really align your team to them. 
I think about visual content, I think having a visual style guide is hugely important, uh, especially if you have a team where there might be multiple photographers, you're using a lot of uh, freelance photographers, be able to give them a guide that really aligns them stylistically, uh, provides that high level art direction, shows exemplary imagery, and a sense of the type of photo composition, those dynamics that you're aiming for, can really help reinforce your goals. A digital asset manager can also be used to help you just have a better sense of how your photography is being used. Uh, think about how you could use that to avoid tokenism. Um, you know, we definitely have done user research where someone says, oh, there is, there is that, that guy, is a, there's a young black man. I see him on every page. So that's your, your token black guy that you have on your website. And I have a negative feeling about that uh, because I, I, I see that as tokenism. So being able to sort of understand how you're using the assets that you have uh, can help uh, avoid that perception. Campus maps are actually a really uh, helpful way to be able to surface these priorities. So if you're surfacing um, uh, all gender restrooms, if you're surfacing accessibility, uh, accessible entrances, uh, those kinds of uh, things, being, it, it has a very uh, practical purpose, helping people find those resources, but baking those in as filters or options in the map, just having that option alone uh, it really speaks loudly to communicate that these are, you know, we value these members of our community. We want to make our campus welcoming and open to them, and we're accounting for that even in the campus map. And even when you're looking at uh, sort of uh, that micro content, file names, alt text, captions, make sure you're providing full context for visitors who are using the screen reader so they can fully understand the content. And of course, it helps boost your SEO as well. But the most important thing is that um, you're, you know, being uh, true and descriptive. I love this resource so much, a California State University's Diversity Style Guide. Um, it addresses gender, LGBTQIA issues, disabilities, race and ethnicity, uh, low income backgrounds. Um, it's a huge resource. And this is what they say, which I thought was really great. As the country's most diverse and largest public four-year institution of higher learning, the California State University has a particular obligation in setting the example for inclusiveness. So they really saw themselves in a position to create this resource to be of use to everybody. And they say it's the first step. They know it's ever evolving. Uh, and they're really looking to their, their employees, their staff, to offer direction. And it's so important to know that a style guide is never done. Uh, we have a, a very different understanding of how to speak about and refer to and communicate with trans individuals, for example, than we might have five or 10 years ago. Um, so if you have a style guide, that needs to evolve to account for that. So inclusive language guidelines are, are really important. Uh, some good examples, Boston University, University of Idaho, MIT, University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Uh, I think that they do some, uh, those are good models to look for in terms of editorial uh, inclusive language guidelines. Um, little touches can also have major impact. So this is a, from a blog from Oberlin College. Um, so this is, this is the bio, of one of the bloggers, so they put their interest, their major, et cetera, but also has their pronouns. It does not take much to include this, but including this is really meaningful both to that student, but also to prospective students who might be viewing this blog and saying, okay, this is a place where how I identify matters and people respect that. And that can have a big impact. So we're talking about accessibility. It's not just about uh, sort of making sure that your content can be viewed via a screen reader. Ability is also uh, a really important factor in, in communicating inclusively. That could be making sure that we have alt text with images for those with low vision, providing transcripts for those who are hard of hearing, considering how motion might affect those who are prone to seizures, uh, using plain language to ensure that people with learning disabilities or for whom English is a second language uh, can comprehend your information. Um, some good guides are out there by um, Washington University, uh, NC State, uh, University of Pittsburgh, um, some really great uh, models there to look to. Um, so website information architecture can also be a way that you're really signaling uh, the importance of these factors. So you think about uh, housing and dining. Um, if you have a dining section where the nutrition, uh, how you cater to different nutritional needs is really easily accessible. So I keep kosher, I, I, halal, I'm vegan, I have different allergies. By having really clear information on how I can have a successful dining experience at your institution, having it really accessible on the website, uh, again, that really, speak, that's, that's, that really speaks loudly to show that 
that not just what your dining sources are doing, uh, but that you want people to have that information because the information is going to empower them and give them confidence to say, okay, I know I'm going to be safe here. They're looking out for my safety. They take this seriously. Um, and that's going to obviously help build that affinity, but also give them their information that they need um, to be able to, to stay safe, to adhere to their principles or their faith. Residential life is also an area where this could come out from Middlebury College. They have all gender housing. So it's very clear on their website. They have a description of what that means uh, and how it plays out. Um, that may not be something that every student or, or family member is interested in uh, pursuing, um, but they're going to be able to offer that and have that clearly available on the website and just presented as it's another housing option that we have and here's what it means. Um, again, that's significant to be able to uh, just present that information there um, and have that as an option. Student clubs and organizations are also really important. When you think about, um, particularly I think about first generation students who don't have a lot of family support um, for co understanding college. Um, so they may be looking for uh, support when they get to school. Uh, oftentimes first generation students are coming from um, you know, uh, different uh, racial backgrounds, different uh, ethnicities, and they might be looking for support. So having a, a cultural affinity group that they can join can help provide some of that support and reassurance when they're going into uh, kind of a new environment in college. Um, Harvard College does a great job of using a tool to really present and organize their uh, student clubs. Tufts University just has a great list here of their cultural organizations. So, um, you know, if I'm Korean, if I'm Cape Verdean, whatever it may be, I can see there's a club for me. I can go and look at more information and find that. Um, so again, uh, sometimes, you know, student clubs, they're a moving target, right? They change every year, they new ones start, when clubs get abandoned, it, it can be really hard. And it might be, just be easy to say, if we have more than 100 clubs and they're great. Um, but particularly for, for these types of clubs, I think it's important to um, surface that because having those kinds of groups and communities available uh, to people who have been sort of systematically disenfranchised is, is really hugely, it's empowering and, and helpful to have that support. So also when we're talking about those different sort of resources, cultural resources on campus, how we talk about and show them is really important. So here's an example of a school that has an African diaspora cultural center. And this was the picture on the page for that center. It's not impressive. It's a house that needs a paint job, right? This does not really give me a sense of, this is if I'm someone for whom this center would be relevant, this does not really speak to me um, or really give me a sense of what that's gonna be like. Now, elsewhere on the website, it's actually in a, a sort of a fundraising part of the website, they had a picture of the interior. And this mural is beautiful. Uh, and it certainly communicates a lot more than sort of a, a shabby white house uh, with some nice trees around it. Um, it's just a lobby, but the mural is, is really powerful here. So, um, you know, higher ed sometimes has a, a habit of defaulting to that building view um, and sort of just showing the building as a means of showing the thing. But, you know, it's, it's just the lobby. Sometimes having that interior shot or having something that shows some of the detail that's going to provide people with a little more meaningful texture to understand, oh, okay. Um, this is something that resonates with me. This shows that uh, this is a place where I, I might belong. And that sense of belonging is really important. Another sort of important asset when we're thinking about the, the information architecture is uh, the diversity page. So a lot of uh, higher websites have a section, uh, whether it's an office for diversity inclusion or sort of like a diversity page where they're sort of laying out the priorities and whatnot. Uh, this here from Wichita State is an example of that sort of rainbow photo I talked about earlier, which you should really avoid at all costs. Um, None of these people probably know each other. They're, they're just sort of standing here very, looking very nice for a picture. Um, this doesn't tell me anything about um, what Wichita State actually, they, they, they could have a very richly diverse and inclusive community, but this photo does not tell me that. This photo tells me that they got these people together for a photo shoot, right? Um, so people are, you know, it is not the job of just this section of your site to do the whole of the work of communicating about how you are inclusive and how you celebrate diversity. Um, it's important that, you know, this is important because people will come here to kind of see like, what's your statement here? Like, how are you, how are you talking about this? Like, what's your, what's your statement on this issue? 
but then they're going to sort of see if that gets sort of uh, lived out or proved across the rest of your website. So you can't sort of do work in th on this page or this section and consider it a done job that now you've talked about diversity and now I can just go write about biology and not think about it. Um, this, this section, this type of page is really important because uh, it's going to really be where people say like, how much does this matter to you and what are you doing? But then they want to see that lived out uh, in ways big and small across the west, the rest of your website. So for this site, it's a few things to keep in mind. You want to avoid floral prose and sweeping rhetoric. This isn't about big inspirational statements. It's about sort of being giving a sense of confidence that this matters. We're doing things. We're working on it. Here's what that is. Be clear and direct. Make this easy to find. Make it globally linked in your footer put it, or, or your header. Make it you know, prominent in your about section. Don't make people have to hunt to find this information. Get community input. Again, um, a lot of times this is going to be reflecting uh, priorities from offices that are very close to the president and, and it's sort of top executive leadership at the institution. But, um, you know, again, the, 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 your, your community lives across your institution. So get that input. Like, are there, is there something cool that we're doing that we're missing here? Uh, does this, does how we're contextualizing this priority, does that make sense? Does that feel uh, accurate? Does that feel like that's gonna give a sense of, of what we're doing and where we're at? Then it's, again, as we're avoiding that sweeping rhetoric, we're really sharing concrete current information. What are the initiatives that you have, whether it's sort of like lecture series or uh, annual events, um, you know, or different sort of uh, research activities that are happening. Do you have milestone events every year? Is there, a, you know, an MLK Day event where there's readings and it's a big deal on campus? Um, is there sort of a, a cultural day or cultural festival that the students organize every year? Any recent accolades that you've gotten? Have there been any designations or awards um, or other sort of honors that are sort of calling out, um, you know, anything about uh, you know, if you award a significant number of graduate degrees um, to, uh, to to certain segments of students um, or something like that, what can you note here? What centers do you have on campus that might relate to this? So if you have, um, you know, center for you know, African diaspora center or sort of other areas, um, you know, can you highlight those? Can you show how it's not just what you're talking about, but it's really baked into sort of the academic and research function uh, of your institution? And then do you have a, a story to tell with data? Um, you know, if you have a story to tell in terms of faculty hiring, if you have a story to tell in terms of your, your student population, um, don't be afraid to show that. Maybe five years ago, you, you, you wouldn't want to talk about where you were, but maybe you're in a better place now uh, in terms of reaching your goals. Um, again, it's one thing to say, hey, we're working on it, this matters. It's another thing to say, we did these things and now look, look at this trend, uh, look at what's happening. Um, you know, if you're truly putting in the work um, to uh, recruit a more diverse faculty, to recruit a more diverse class, to sort of um, really, uh, you know, walk the walk and not just talk the talk. And if you have data that shows that, this is a great place to sort of uh, celebrate that and to promote that. But how do we really do it, <laughs> right? Uh, there's a lot of um, sort of tactics, there's a lot of sort of ideas, a lot of things that you can do to sort of um, build process um, and assess things and audit things. And that's all very important. Um, and that all really matters. Um, but if your institution is not truly prioritizing these things, no amount of auditing or writing or photography or marketing can really make up for that. Um, if your institution is really truly working on this stuff, that's going to make your job a lot easier because all you have to do is then create content about it, right? You're just kind of reflecting it back out. Um, so if your institution is not really working on these things, your job is not necessarily then to, to write or to audit or whatnot. It's to be a force for change. It's to speak up. Uh, it's to help educate uh, people about why these things are important, about how they will advance the institution, about how, the, how they will uh, help improve the lives of the community, how they will, um, you know, just create a positive impact. So, um, you know, I think that in addition to the work, there's the advocacy uh, and, and, and the speaking up. Uh, again, because as I said at the outset, it's about just doing the right thing, uh, and that's what matters. So um, I hope that uh, this presentation has given you some interesting ideas um, for how to sort of think about communicating uh, more uh, inclusively uh, at your institution, and, and hopefully inspired you as to why this is important and why this matters. Uh, I really appreciate being able to share these ideas with you. Uh, thank you again. Look forward to talking more about this. Take care.